Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Ralph Jacobson. And I'm Catherine Schifferdecke. This is the podcast for September 11th, 2022. And regular listeners over the years will have noticed that Craig Kester, uh, who's been here, I think, for almost every one of the podcasts, um, is not here because uh, Craig retired. And moving into retirement, he really wanted to make a uh, sort of very clean and full separation from previous in, uh, responsibilities. So we miss him very much. Yes, yes, indeed we do. Craig uh, always offered, I, 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 Craig is a good friend, uh, and he always has profound theological insights spoken in whole paragraphs. I don't know how he it just kind of birthed completely from his uh, from his brain. So we will miss him very much. We will have other uh, guests on this podcast, other, other not just guests, but other uh, participants on the podcast. Uh, we're, we were not able to schedule someone for, uh, for today, but, uh, but it will be an, a third person in addition to Rolf and myself. But uh, we look forward to those participants and we wish Craig all the best in his retirement. Yeah, exactly. He's working on a major uh, commentary on the Gospel of John. And uh, so we will eagerly wait that in, I suppose, another five years. <laughs> so <laughs> with these projects. All right. So this, the text for September 11th, 2022 is Genesis. Uh, it's the flood story. So there's passages from chapter 6, 5 through 22, chapter 8, 6 through 12, and chapter 9, 8 through 17. So a reminder that the first week of the narrative lectionary, um, every year we do one of the sort of, um, a story from Genesis 1 through 11, creation story or fall story. Here's the flood story. Um, I don't know about you, Catherine, but when I was uh, sort of a newly minted uh, Old Testament uh, PhD, I still didn't know what to do with the flood story because I spent, you know, it spent all my head for years in the Psalms. And what do you do with this story that we, we, we make children's toys out of it because they're so cute, but it's a story about God just, just deciding to destroy humanity because humanity, the th it says the thoughts were nothing but evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I've often wondered, I thought the same thing. I remember when I was pregnant with my first child, Esther, uh, I was a pastor at a wonderful church in, uh, in Wisconsin, Trinity Lutheran in Arkdale, Wisconsin. And I was asked what the theme of my nurse, of the nursery would be, which shows that this person didn't particularly know me because they know <laughs> that I'm not, I'm, I don't have themes for rooms, uh, but uh, the, the, a lot of the gifts that I got were uh, Noah's Ark themed. And it's, it's kind of dark when you think about it. I mean, uh, you know, it, it sounds great, or it looks beautiful, all these pairs of animals going into the Ark. And Noah's usually depicted as this kind of Santa Claus figure, kind of jovial. But it's a very dark uh, story because people are dying. Uh, the whole earth is being wiped out. Uh, because, as you said, Ralph, in, in uh, chapter 6, verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. Yeah, so here's, I finally came to peace with the story in this way, um, that God, in God's character, has a set, has um sort of a cluster of values that are justice and righteousness and purity and truth. And when God's values of justice looks at human beings, I mean, just like look at what's going on in Ukraine alone this year mm -hmm. or um, in Sudan in recent years. Look what's going on at the border, you know what I mean, in, of our country. And this text affirms that God does not just go, eh, whatever, that's the way these people are. God really, um, God's heart is turned against such violence. And God values justice so much that the story says God came this close to starting over. Mm -hmm. But then God noticed Noah. And Noah is a symbol for that, for, for me, for that in which all humanity there's something that it says, Noah found favor uh, in the Lord's eyes. And so it's, um, the word's really, it's Hain, it's grace. 
Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you, you might know more about that word than I do, I suspect. Uh, uh, what does that mean to you that Noah found Cain? Um, I think it, the, it becomes Hannah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Noah found favor. Noah, Noah was pleasing uh, to God, right? Noah's actions, Noah's character, uh, Noah's integrity was pleasing to God. I, I, I know this is a weird, well, it, it's a pop culture reference and I'm not usually known for those, but did you, did you see that movie, uh, Noah? I, this is maybe nope. eight years ago. So it's, um, uh, who's the guy who played Gladiator? I know who you mean. Yeah. yeah. We are not the right people for this. We are not. Uh, anyway, he's, he plays Noah and it's a, it's a kind of ridiculous movie in a lot of ways. But one thing they did really well in that movie was to depict the kind of defilement of the earth through yeah. human because of human action, uh, and and so that so that it it almost seems inevitable the destruction of the earth that is begun by human beings themselves, right? Uh, that this kind of human sin that defiles the earth. That the uh, uh, Russell Crowe. That's who I'm thinking. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it did a good job of that. And I think in that sense, it's actually, uh, it, it, in a lot of ways that movie was not biblical, but in this sense it was in that, uh, and, and our now uh, past uh, dearly beloved uh, colleague, Terry Fretheim pointed this out several times. The, the same Hebrew words used for human beings corrupting of the earth is the same word used for God's, dis for, for the destruction of the earth. So it's a kind of, um, the the punishment fits the crime, or the the sin has its own punishment kind of already in it, right? The human beings corrupt the earth, and so the earth is corrupted and eventually is destroyed because of that corruption. And at the same time, what Terry Fredholm has mentioned is that, uh, or, or has talked about, is that verse that we both mentioned before, right? That the Lord saw that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. It says the same thing after the flood story. So this is chapter eight, yeah, uh, verse 21. The Lord uh, said to, in, in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of hum humankind. For the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done. So human beings don't change from the beginning of the flood to the end of the flood. God changes God's mind, right? Uh, yes, every inclination of the human heart is only evil however <laughs> i'm not going to let that sin destroy the earth again so the so the story for me ends up being about the faithfulness of god right god's promise at the end never to uh never to allow human sin to utterly destroy the earth again yes so, so that's the other set of values that god has is god's faithfulness grace forgiveness mercy and in a very it's very close, right? Which, which set of values God is going to value more, but God's commitment to the beloved creation is the enduring thing. Uh, one thing about the middle scene in chapter eight, uh, people might want to extend the reading uh, past verse 12 up to where you were, but you've got the symbol of the dove, you know, uh, the, yeah. uh, which becomes a symbol of peace. And that might be, people might have a three point sermon on first the ark, you know, as a symbol of God's preserving and commitment to preserving living creatures, and then the dove, the symbol of peace, and then, of course, finally, the rainbow. And, um, of course, the rainbow has been, um, the meaning of it has changed secularly, but a reminder that the rainbow is the sign of God's covenant that God puts in the sky, not to remind us that God is a covenanting God, and that's a theme. The first five weeks, there'll be uh, covenant texts. But God puts it in the sky to remind God that God had made a promise. And again, so God, our, our colleagues in the Reformed tradition, Catherine, you and I are both suffer from being Lutheran, often stress the freedom of God. Mm -hmm. But uh, our friend Terry Fretheim uh, taught us also that there is God chooses not to be free to do some things so that when God binds himself in covenant, God is saying, I am limiting in my freedom. Here's things I won't do. I won't forsake you. Yeah, I won't destroy the earth again. I won't, yeah. Yeah, 
yeah, I think that's that's a, a beautiful takeaway from this story that God is that that the the promises that God makes not uh, only uh, obligate human beings, but that covenant making, well, we'll be talking about that in future weeks, that covenant making, uh, placing an obligation on human beings, but as you say, in, in a sense, binding God or uh, God limits God's self, God's own power uh, out of love for humankind. So, uh, so God's faithfulness is on display here in this very strange story uh, that is uh, familiar and yet not familiar. So uh, some of you are going to be uh, celebrating rally day perhaps on this day uh, in some ways that this story is appropriate uh, for that since it's used so often as a kind of Sunday school story. Uh, but this text and this Sunday gives you an opportunity to explore it in ways that perhaps people haven't thought about before and, and that are more meaningful or just as meaningful to adults uh, as to children. So God's faithfulness, God's promises, uh, God's commitment to humanity and to the, the earth itself. God makes a covenant, not just with human, humanity, but with all of creation. These are themes that you could explore in your sermon for this one.